Welcome to Dialogue 2 Session Special, Agenda for Progress. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang held a press conference after the close of the fourth session of the 13th National People's Congress, that is China's Parliament. In two hours, he answered questions about a range of issues, including people's livelihood, the Chinese economy, Hong Kong, and the China-U.S. relationship. What did we learn about China's economic goals? Will Chinese living standards improve further in the coming years? And is there reason to be more optimistic about China-U.S. relations going forward? To discuss all these issues and more, we're joined in the studio by Yao Yang Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University and Lawrence Brom, Senior Fellow with the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome, gentlemen. That is our topic. I'm Wang Guan. Professor Yang and um, Lawrence, so good to have both of you back to our studio. Uh, good to be back here. You know, full capacity in our studio. I think this says <laughs> a lot about um, the post-COVID recovery. After um, COVID, we're back, right? Yeah, I know, right. finally, um, finally. So let me go to you first, Professor Yao, your takeaway from um, Premier Li's press conference. Well, it was uh, impressive. Uh, uh, Premier Li was uh, were attended. Uh, he answered uh, all the hard questions, uh, you know, and uh, he didn't even evade any of them. Uh, my impression, the most important Im uh, impression was his uh, emphasis on employment and the people's uh, livelihood. You know, last year we had uh, a serious problem of unemployment, but the government more than fulfilled its target of providing 9 million uh, jobs, eventually 11 uh, million jobs were provided. And this year, the government uh, is going to provide more than uh, 10 million jobs again. Uh, I think that's a uh, very good progress uh, after the pandemic. Yeah, so uh, we didn't hear about the stock market or the financial market. Right. It's about jobs. The GDP is all about jobs. Uh, it's about people. Uh, Lawrence, uh, what things struck you during this two-hour press conference? You just said it. It didn't. There was nothing about the stock market, and I think this is very important because if you look at the economy, the whole focus is building an economy of substance, one with steady growth, having little volatility, improvement in people's lives, uh, building a middle class, addressing issues like health care and doing it in a very stable way. And he made very specific reference to no quantitative easing. And we have to understand what this means because China's taking a policy approach to its monetary policy, its fiscal policy, very different from the United States and many of the European countries that are following the U.S. model. The U.S. model since 2008 has been to buy back its own debt and issue liquidity against debt, which is just an incredible debt conundrum. And in turn, throw that money at the capital market. Now, this has had the effect of making a supreme elite super rich. So effectively, 1% of 1% of the population is now controlling about 80% of all the assets. And that's very different than the approach, because what that has done is it has basically um, De destroyed the middle class. It's made the middle class go into the into the poor, and that's why you have so much political instability right now, riots, protests, all that happening in America. The message from Premier Li was we're going to build the middle class. We're not going to do this. We're not going to create an artificial economy by having debt buybacks and issuing vast amount of liquidity to the stock market. The stock market is not the economy. The economy is people, trades, and services, and that in turn is what builds a stable middle class. That was the message that I took away. And then to add on the improvements in health care, environmental cleanup, new energy, and especially focus on youth education and the importance of a new technology economy that's not going to be just about social media, but applying that technology to the issues of health care, of environment, the things that improve people's lives. Yeah, remember um, Premier Li talked about the fact that he was doing a field trip uh, in the province of China, whereby he stopped over um, you know, a shop owner's place, uh, talking to them, asking them about unemployment situation. And people were like, uh, they didn't really uh, you know, um, fire anyone uh, thanks to the government uh, exemption of rent there. Um, what, what are the other highlights from this press conference when it comes to China's employment? Um, mm -hmm. Professor Yao, what can we know about China's economy and its direction in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still uh, remember that moment that actually Premier, Premier Li took a detour uh, to go to that shop 
and walking on the uh, small street and uh, talking with people, right? So that was uh, so warm uh, to all people in China. Uh, I, I think uh, this year's recovery in China uh, will be uh, beyond our expectation. Uh, look at uh, this uh, last uh, two months export, it grew by 60%. Right. It's just a total beyond anyone's expectation. So with that, uh, it, uh, export uh, can easily grow by 10 percent at least uh, in the, the whole year, right? And then think about the investment. Uh, last year, we, uh, we, we did have a stimulus package, but of course much smaller than the American or uh, Europeans, right? Uh, but uh, that worked, okay? Uh, but then consumption is going to pick up uh, this year. My uh, guess is that consumption probably is going to grow by at least 7 uh, percent. Uh, probably we can reach even 10 percent because last year it dropped by about 3 percent. Yeah, consumption was not very strong in right. particular. Compared yeah, to but, but this year I think it's going to come back. All right. Uh, Lawrence, is that also uh, your sense? Sure. In anticipation of global decoupling, what you see now is more, you know, local populism in Western countries accompanied by sanctions, nationalism, and of course the uh, breaking down of the globalization process, which has taken decades to build. There's anticipation for that and an intention now to have an economy that's focused more on domestic growth and in turn domestic consumption, which is very different than the past few decades where China has been the factory of the world export market where it has driven its exports as its economy and has depended on Western markets. I think the message here is it's more dependency on its own domestic market, which also means upgrading facilities and uh, many care benefits and reducing burdens. That was another message that came through. Where there's stress points, reducing taxes, supporting uh, medical care in a more uh, broad manner so that people can have really less stress points as they build the domestic economy. Uh, and of yeah. course, the key point was education. Right, that, right. I think, was a big focus. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. But this press conference, uh, Professor Yang, is not just about, uh, I mean, this MPC is not just about this premier's press conference. It lasted right. uh, a good 10 days. Right. Uh, a whole range of legislations uh, were passed uh, concerning biosafety, uh, mm -hmm. its economy, uh, setting economic targets. Um, what can an average Chinese like myself or, you know, people like ourselves um, uh, feel as a tangible thing uh, going mm -hmm. forward uh, thanks to this um, year's mm -hmm. press conference, this year's uh, legislations. Yeah, I think the most uh, important thing for this year's conference is that uh, the MPC approved uh, the 14th five-year plan and also uh, the long-term goal for 2035. Uh, one of the targets uh, for 2035 is that we are going to double our income uh, from this uh, last year's uh, income. So this means that by 2035, uh, China, average Chinese is going to live a life just like uh, the average citizen probably in uh, Southern Europe, mm -hmm. right? So that's uh, going to be a great progress. And uh, also uh, the plan laid out uh, uh, mirrors and uh, tangible actions to reach uh, in, 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 uh, emission zero by 2060 mm -hmm. uh, and also to flatten China's uh, emission by 2030. Uh, that's a daunting task, but uh, we have started uh, the steps and I believe we can do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this top-down approach, five-year plans, uh, you know, inherited from the Soviet system, but of course renovated and tailored to the Chinese reality uh, had there been any uh, Western thinking or rethinking about this kind of Chinese model uh, other than criticism and stereotypes? Well, I think many developing countries are looking at it as the model because the Western approach or what they call, you know, sort of fund market fundamentalism, yeah. uh, in fact, doesn't work. And it hasn't worked in the United States. You see also interventions of the government when the market drops, they'll stop trading. It's the same thing. But the advantage of a plan is you're looking forward. I think Premier Lee emphasized it is a market economy with planning, as to say it's a planned economy with market. And the planning helps to give direction, anticipate, uh, particularly like what Professor just said, the energy issue. I mean, here the world is facing 
a climate crisis that is screaming at everybody in the face. You have to do something to address it. And through the ecological policies, uh, you have a very clear shift from fossil fuels to renewables. Now, let's, when we started the ec ecological civilization policy back in 2013, I was part of the drafting committee of that that was approved in 2015. At that time, coal was 80 percent of China's energy. Now, projecting forward by 2050, 80 percent of China's energy will be green, and by 2060, China will be completely carbon neutral. You can't do that without a plan. You can't do that without coordination of all the different aspects of the economy. And you can't do it without market factors. You just have to drive those market factors, stimulate them to be able to move in that direction. There are certain provinces like Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, Shanxi, which are coal dependent. How do you switch their dependency on coal to other areas like wind? That means new investments. That means green bonds. Uh, China now has the largest, certainly domestically, it's the largest issuer of green, green bonds. And that is significant because all of that's going into infrastructure overhaul for the future. In turn, when you have clean air, clean water, you have water security, food security, health security, improvement in people's lives. And that goes back to what Premier Li was emphasizing, the importance of quality of life rather than quantity. Yeah, 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 the air is getting cleaner in China, in Beijing in particular. Not clean enough, but uh, hopefully many people hope that it will keep uh, going in that direction. Let's talk about um, U.S.-China relations. That is a big focus during this year's MPC. Uh, believe it or not, it is supposed to be a Chinese domestic legislative session, but lots of questions were asked about Beijing's uh, hopes um, for a Biden administration. Um, your expectations, Professor Yao, uh, when it comes to the Anchorage meeting, between mm -hmm. senior Chinese and American officials uh, taking place in a week. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, meeting is always good. But I also want to tell you uh, my personal anecdotes. Uh, actually, Anchorage was uh, the first city I ever landed in the United States. Uh, when I went to the United States to study in 1991, that was the city I landed the first. But anyway, was Anchorage? That, yeah, Anchorage, oh. to refill, right. Uh, but that says a lot. This is actually in the middle between mainland U.S. and mainland China. So it kind of serves as a bridge for the two countries to meet again. Uh, we don't know what's going to be talked about, but talking is going to be good. Uh, in my opinion, it's very hard to solve many uh, issues like ideology, like a geopolitical, uh, technological competition. But on trade issue, on people exchanges, I believe there can be uh, improvements. Right? Usually this sort of meetings uh, set the stage for high level meetings and hopefully, um, presumably, mm -hmm. uh, you know, leadership level meetings. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that is the case that, or that could be the case this time around, Lawrence? It's a first start, but I'll, I'll also tell a personal story yeah, as we're on this because um, well, much of my work is making documentary films. And we recently made a film called Searching for Kung Fu. And the point of that film was to really not just talk about China's different martial arts and how they're done, but to talk about the inner values of those martial arts. Kung Fu is about respect. It's about loyalty. There's a whole code. It's about balance, finding a middle way, not going to extremes. It's about loyalty, trust. These are all factors, uh, harmony with nature. And these are Chinese values, but they're also universal values. Universal values are not just about two parties having an election and fighting. It's about a broader spectrum of things that can make our planet a better place. And we really felt that by launching this film at this time, the message was you need a new ping pong diplomacy. Ping pong diplomacy was another way of sort of breaking the ice yeah. of the Cold War era. Now we're hoping for a reset with Biden that maybe there can be an improvement in the relations Rather than starting off arguing about the differences, let's find some commonalities. And the best place to do that is with sports and culture and finding values. Because frankly, there's not enough respect and loyalty in the American political system. They could actually use some of those values too. And in a way, by starting off with this kind of an approach, then let's think about searching for Kung Fu or Kung Fu diplomacy as the new sort of ping pong diplomacy of another time or another new era when we need to thaw uh, kind of a new Cold War. 
and get out of that and uh, let's have a little warm up in the spring. So um, that's, that's my personal tell, story. Tell us more about it. I mean, uh, are you making the, the film? Oh, the film's been finished. It's already won a number of awards uh, internationally in Canada. We've just been selected in Berlin for a film festival. Are they premiered in the, in the US market? It, it has not yet. It actually won the Khan, Khan Silk Road Film Award for Best Documentary Story. And really what we do is, myself as a martial artist, I've done martial arts for more than 40 years, um, and it's about the exploration of the values that are underlying Kung Fu. And I think the most important thing is Wu Shu, the Chinese character, has two radicals, Wu. Uh, and the Wu is two radicals. One is Zhi, which means to stop, and the other is Ge and weapon. So actually martial arts in Chinese Wu Shu is not translated as martial arts. It's actually translated as the art of nonviolence mm -hmm. because the character Wu is about stopping violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an underlying point because people Man. who practice martial arts... I'm educated. Uh, will, ...will not yeah, fight. I never thought it that way. You know, we'll grew up fight. speaking Chinese, uh, we never thought it that you way. You know, loyalty <laughs> is very important. And I think this is the starting point of U.S.-China relations. Meet, if you're going to meet in Anchorage, you're meeting a halfway point, it seems. That's the message being delivered. But it's about nonviolence because this planet needs these two powers to work together because we are mm -hmm. a tiny little air pocket in space and if they don't work together and over really very short-sighted issues uh, we lose peace then we lose everything and that's not just about us china it's about everybody so everybody depends on this relationship yeah, i want to pick up on what you said uh, professor yang you teach at one of china's and um, perhaps one of the world's most prestigious universities okay. one of the most t prestigious schools uh, in beida um, how do you look at this perception gap? I mean, misunderstanding between Chinese and Americans. They have filters, media mm -hmm. telling them what the other country is all about, mm -hmm. which oftentimes is not true. Uh, yeah, to me, I, I don't think uh, there is a, a much perception, uh, misconception between those two countries before Trump. I think the misconception about the two countries uh, started uh, in the Trump uh, administration because Trump used to also serve, uh, you know, words, try to demonize uh, China, and particularly his uh, Secretary of State, Pompeo, uh, did all sorts of things uh, uh, to banish China. And that actually has a lot of influence on American press. And of course, uh, there is uh, some echoing from China. And that's uh, not normal between those two countries. I think the normal situation is that the, the people um, in both uh, countries can understand each other. And mm -hmm. the, uh, because I experienced that, I studied in the United States, uh, I went to the United States many, many times. I didn't feel that kind of perception uh, gap. It's, it was uh, only in the last four years. Yeah, people hear so much about policies, issues, politicians, you know, campaign promises, uh, not, not so much about, uh, you know, the, uh, what's lying at the heart of each other's cultures, for example, martial arts. Well, we'll go back to that. If we could get everybody in Congress to be practicing Tai Chi <laughs> in the morning outside the Capitol building, not only would it be good for U.S.-China relations, it would be really good for a lot of American domestic policy as well. I think these people would have a much more uh, you know, <laughs> harmonious approach to trying to deal with the world and to dealing with their own relations rather than fighting with but each I think other all Marco the time. Rubio in Texas yeah. will, will be the first uh, to jump out and criticize those things as, uh, as communist, you know? Martial arts is communist, um, isn't it? Now, I want to shift gears a little bit, uh, as, ha as uh, happy as I would like to engage in this topic further. Tai uh, Hong Kong, you know, this new legislation passed about uh, improving its electoral system. We saw the protests in Hong Kong mm -hmm. over the past few years, uh, chaotic, uh, not pleasant. Uh, and this round of legislative reforms have generated uh, controversy in the West. Um, you know, some Western headlines say this is the end of uh, democracy in Hong Kong. How do you look at it, Darms? Well, I remember I, we were actually filming in Hong Kong, searching for Kung Fu when those protests were going on, and it actually disrupted. We were supposed to have an actual interview with Yip Man's son, and you had the subways you couldn't ride, bombs were being thrown, uh, acid was being thrown on people. We couldn't, the streets couldn't function. The whole city was not able to function. And Hong Kong is one of the leading global financial centers. 
And this doesn't help anybody. And of course, there's been a lot of outside interference, so we, we know about that. But at the same time, if you really want to try and have political discussion or protests, if you're walking down the street with an American flag protesting against your government in Hong Kong, I don't think that would be tolerated in the U.S. I think if somebody was carrying a Chinese flag or a Russian flag mm -hmm. or an Iranian flag or a German flag or even mm -hmm. a British flag and protesting in front of Capitol Hill, that, that's not going to go very far. Right. They're, going to, they're going to be stopped. But I think everybody in Hong Kong tolerated and tolerated and tolerated to a certain point. But you've got to get that economy back to functioning again. You've got to get back to work. And it is not only the financial center for China, it is a major clearing center for a lot of China's globalization of its currency, for the Belt and Road, for international trade. Um, and so addressing this issue, you need to be able to work constructively. And I think a constructive approach to solving real problems, and particularly the economic integration of much of Hong Kong's financial sector with the technology AI sector that's going on in the greater Bay Area. You need to have some stability before you can do that. At the same time, a lot of Hong Kong youth feel themselves distraught. Housing prices have been way too high. People are trying, young people are very easy to be drawn into having anger and frustration because they don't see a future if they don't have at least the ability to buy a home, to be able to, to live easily. And in this respect, I think policies need to come into the city, which is very capitalist, very market oriented. You need some planning. You need to be able to have some low cost housing, youth housing, and you need to be able to develop that or the infrastructure that's going to enable people to commute very quickly into the Bay Area and back and to give people that opportunity. So it's really a two way thing. One, to address the political issue, but at the same time to address the economic issue that's going to give people more hope and faith. Because if people have hope in their future, they have something to live for and to fight for for their future, not to fight against something which is kind of not going anywhere. It's just a, a circle. Right. Professor Yao, uh, Yao, how do you look at the, the, the latest reforms to change Hong Kong's uh, way of electing its uh, legislators mm -hmm. and the chief mm -hmm. executive? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, this is a, a stop of democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, to pra practice democracy, you need a lot of infrastructure, right? First, you have to have a mutual understanding, the values, uh, you have to share a common goal, all sorts of things. Uh, we, you know, this is a short program. But we don't have much time yeah, to yeah. talk about uh, that. An educated citizenry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all the things. But look at those uh, protesters. Uh, they went beyond uh, those basic uh, requirements, right? Uh, they didn't uh, just uh, go violent. Uh, some of them uh, even started uh, uh, this mental actions, right? And many of them actually began to uh, or want to uh, separate from uh, China, right? Uh, uh, and uh, while it, uh, there's uh, one country, two system uh, design. Yeah, that, that's a, I think that's a critical. Remember what happened to Carlos Puigdemont, the pro-independence leader in Catalonia, part of Spain, the autonomous yeah. region in Spain. When he declared independence, the prime minister of Spain went all out, arrested him. Yeah. That guy went into refuge in, I think, the Netherlands or Germany. And, and nobody then, in Washington said anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. a very different treatment there. <laughs> right. Um, so this new rule of patriots administering Hong Kong, it, 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 it's not the Chinese invention. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a question now of trying to get back to addressing core problems, legislation, youth empowerment, giving them a future, housing issues. Uh, you have a multi-party system in Hong Kong. But the question is, if you're having rioting in the street all the time, I'm sorry, that would not be tolerated in any country. I have, I have been around the world. I've been in, you know, seen a lot of these kind of protests and things. And as soon as it gets very aggressive, I was at Occupy Wall Street in, in, in uh, New York City. And heck, you had very, very clear rules. If people stepped out of Zakati Park, they're not going to go very far. You know, things were very controlled. And so, you know, you have your rules, you have your ability to express yourself, um, but let's do it as part of one country. Just like in the protests in America, people carry their own flag. If they didn't do that, they're not going to get very far. And I think that that's, I think, the core issue here is recognition. It's one country, two systems. If everybody's on board with that, then to work within that system 
in a constructive way. Of course, there's issues that have to be solved. There's technical issues um, for the future. Again, coming back to housing, that is such a critical problem in Hong Kong, but to do it in a constructive way. Otherwise, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. And to lose Hong Kong as a financial center benefits nobody, it doesn't benefit the students, it doesn't benefit uh, anyone at all. Yeah, we remember Singapore, right? As mm -hmm. successful as Singapore has been, uh, mm -hmm. there has been no change of ruling party, mm -hmm. People's Action Party, uh, mm -hmm. you know, founded by Lee Kuan Yew, mm -hmm. is still in power today. And Singapore is one of the most successful countries, arguably, in the world. Uh, yeah, history tells us uh, if you want to start a democracy at the uh, very beginning of economic growth, it's going to be really hard. I mean, Hong Kong, of course, is not a low-income place, but it just began to experiment in uh, democracy. It needs a long time uh, to learn how to run a democracy. I think this is the process. I don't think uh, democratization in Hong Kong is going to be stopped. It's going to move on. But we, ha we need uh, to build uh, some basic mutual understanding how to maintain stability in Hong Kong, how to run Hong Kong as a place by Hong Kong people, right? But I, I don't think uh, that consensus has been reached. And this reform is a step to reach that consensus. Yeah, actually, in this uh, reform, uh, I'm not sure if our viewers, uh, especially those friends in the West, uh, read the full document, uh, it says uh, the central government believes uh, there will be, definitely will be, uh, universal suffrage in Hong Kong in mm -hmm. due time. Yeah. Um, but this kind of details is often missed uh, by the Western headlines, of course. That's yeah. a very clear statement, and I think it's an intention to progress forward, not to go backwards. Mm -hmm. And again, you're looking at a system that's been set up of one country, two systems. There has been external interference in that system. Uh, but the from the outside, you've had, uh, you know, again, I was witnessing the protests there myself, and a lot of what was happening was not being reported by the international media. There was only one side being reported. And I think that trying to bring things back into a modicum of system, getting the protests fine, rioting at the degree that it was taking place with bombs and uh, you know acid being thrown, you couldn't walk out into the street at that time. This is, you know, would not be tolerated in any country at all. Uh, you looked at the protests at the ca on Capitol Hill uh, just, a f you know, um, over a month ago with, with, with Trump before he left office and entering the Capitol building. That was not tolerated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a crackdown, even for the swearing in. You had over 20,000 U.S. troops right there in the Capitol yeah, building. Yeah, relate they are. They no arrived. tolerance policy. Yeah. And I think Hong Kong's police force was very tolerant throughout the process of those riots. They worked very hard to try and maintain a degree of calm under a stress situation that they were not trained for, to be very yeah. frank. And they were not prepared for the amount of, should we say, resources that would be behind the protesters. And now to try and work within a system and systematize things. Look, yeah. we're talking about rule of law. So let's work within a legal system. We should also system. remind our viewers that not a single protester died from brew of police uh, force. Um, that is the situation there. We'll have to leave it there, Lawrence and uh, Professor Yao. So good to have you with us in studio, in person. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. Thank you all for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing.